Your Dynasty Rookie Drafts are here. That means we deliver a top 40 rookie rankings just for you. And in fact, Hayden, we flip the tables. My rankings. Yes. And you get to be the passenger. This is a change of roles here. I don't mind it at all. Don't <laughs> mind this at all. <laughs> uh, so how this is going to work. This is super flex, not tight end premium. Uh, I might give a comment here or there. Hayden might do the exact same thing when it comes to tight ends and how they might move up or down mm -hmm. the board based on that. I know most of your rookie drafts out there are 48 picks. That's why I wanted to go all the way to 40. Um, and I'm also tiering them. So you know areas that you might want to trade up to in mm -hmm. order to get one of those premium players that's in a tier above. Yep. And obviously you have to draft around the positions you're strongest and weakest at as well. So helping with the tiers to kind of make those decisions. Okay. It's time. There are three names in the first tier, and we start with Bears quarterback Caleb Williams. No brainer, Hayden. Ideal situation for a rookie quarterback throwing to three wide receivers and an experienced play caller attached to them. To me, it doesn't matter what type of scoring you're really in. I think Caleb yep. Williams has the best chance of being a top five and at worst, a top 10 quarterback here in the near future. He's going to be able to scramble, so that helps us out for fantasy. And it's not even just a short-term thing. DJ Moore and Roma Dunze will be there for the next couple seasons. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is the best prospect we've seen in a very long time. And also, in the ways he wins, is helpful for fantasy. So, yeah, this is the easiest one-on-one -on -one I could remember. Cardinals wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. is up next. You have a top 15 quarterback in the league who now has his top wide receiver. I actually loved what Drew Petzing's offense did last year with some – lesser talents. Uh, he got quite creative in spots. It, he took a lot of Kevin Stefanski principles, which by the way, we saw uh, elevate Omari Cooper into fantastic status this past year. Mm -hmm. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the true ex who wins in the dark arts already has extreme body control. Uh, his one-on-one -on -one situations are fantastic. And I'm excited to see Kyler with this level and this type of a wide receiver yeah. attached to him. Kyler also under contract long-term. I think that his numbers are going to be good enough to justify his own contract. So Marvin's going to be in a very healthy situation without much wide receiver help behind him. It's going to be just him and Trey McBride, I think, for the foreseeable future. Right now, underdog, pick him lobby for Marvin Harrison. This year, a 1,000 yards is the mm -hmm. higher lower. Pretty rare for a rookie wide receiver to be in that uh, four digits. Yes, it is. Number three, Giants wide receiver Malik Neighbors. The number one pass catcher on this team in year one. It's that simple. Literally zero competition. I mean, there's nothing at running back. There's almost certainly nothing at tight end because Darren Waller sounds like he is going to retire. I know this team made the playoffs in yep. 2022. They were awful in 2023. A major part of that was the offensive line being destroyed at the start of the year and then quarterback injuries after that. So I am excited to see a Mike Kafka, Brian Dayball offense for the first time in New York to have a pass catcher that allows them to attack multiple blades of grass. I think they'll be far more vertical than the last time we saw them being good, which was in 2022. Yeah. The only difference is that his uncertainty long-term just tied to the quarterback and head coach and all that type of stuff is a little bit more up in the air versus Marvin Harrison. But both these guys, 99th percentile in my model, everyone knows that these guys are excellent. And I think that it, some teams did have, Bleak neighbors ahead of Marvin Harrison on their own boards, just based off the profiles. Uh, these two guys are complete lights out. These would, would have been the best wide receivers in probably the last five draft classes. Giants GM Joe Shane said that Marv or excuse me, that Malik neighbors was the fourth youngest player on their board out of a 450 in total wow. in their draft class. Uh, he doesn't miss practices. He doesn't miss games. He's weird like that. Excuse me. He's wired like that. I should say <laughs> he's a generator was how Brian Dayball, I like that. Him, which is a cool word yeah. for explosive plays, right? He takes a jet sweep or a short route to the house for 30 plus yards out. He's a generator, I think is one way like I'm going to continue to keep that phrase in mind. Okay. That clears the first tier. Let's yeah. go to the second tier. For me, that begins again, super flex with Drake may. I understand that we can get like short term trees through the forest, that type yep. where the situation is not great right now, but let's also not forget how athletic, Drake may is right. We will get scrambling yards. We will get rushing touchdowns. This is also a quarterback who isn't coming from a perfect situation that he played in, in North Carolina this past season. And we'll get to this when we get to his wide receivers, he's been working out this off season, did a couple of throwing sessions with Jalen Polk, a few throwing sessions with right. Javon Baker. And we have seen this Kevin Stefanski tree 
Drew Petzing previously spoke about, Alex Van Pelt now, have pretty much instant success, and that offense travels. And I'm excited to see Drake May develop as this goes along. Yeah, the Drake May experience, he's super young, so you have to take the really long-term vision here. But it would I would also put him uh, in this exact spot. As a, as a reminder, as a sophomore, he led college football in total EPA, which is the number one stat that I look at for college quarterbacks. And like you just mentioned, for fantasy purposes, he runs a lot. Not only was he top five in his scrambles attempts in the last two seasons when he was a quarterback, he also picks up first downs at an elite rate. Like 50% of his scrambles go for a first round. So he has this like Josh Allen effect where he's scrambling, but it's not like because he has to. He's doing it because it's smart to do that. And he's got the body to kind of uh, hold up long term. Next, Jaden Daniels, fifth overall player. Uh, he's going to start immediately in Washington. Would be a stunner if Marcus Mariota gets any starts. <laughs> that would not be good. <laughs> Uh, they described Jaden Daniels as the best deep ball thrower in the draft and the way that he runs, he takes your soul as a defense. Our buddy Ian Hart, it's just posted a tweet saying and really outlining. If you have 150 rushes at the quarterback position, you're almost destined to be a top seven finisher out there. Um, 150 rushes would be fascinating to see with Jaden Daniels style because his rushing upside is going to be awesome, but it's different than a bunch of other quarterbacks out there. Like I would almost describe it from a scrambling standpoint closer to Justin Fields than I would as mm -hmm. Lamar Jackson. You know, Justin Fields, it's almost all or nothing. Uh, it's less decisive, I think, right. where as Lamar's, we know that he shields his body. He uh, almost glides out there, whereas we've described, at least I have, Jane Daniels as both the Roadrunner and the Wiley Coyote at the exact same time. But again, on top of that rushing, which is fantastic for us in fantasy football, we have Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson out there. And I'm expecting right. a huge third year rebound for Jahan mm -hmm. Dotson. Yeah, that, that'd be very clutch if that happens for Jaden. I think that those two guys can win vertically from the slot and from the outside, which is what Jaden Daniels is familiar with. I am with you that uh, he's closer to fields than Lamar Jackson in terms of pressure as well, how he absorbs that. Lamar Jackson's been pretty good at that. Historically, Justin Fields has been not a starter because of that. We'll see where Jaden Daniels kind of slides into that. He was successful against pressure because he would just run for a 60-yard touchdown. We'll see if that's as likely to do uh, in the NFL, but for fantasy purposes, even if he is a little bit up and down as a passer, uh, we know that he's going to be picking up first downs with his legs. And like Ian said, that's more or less the only thing that matters. At the yeah. position. <laughs> I, I am actually somewhat less concerned while it still is a concern about the middle of the field numbers that he threw at LSU, because I think that offense could operate just like the Philadelphia Eagles offense did, where you have these outside burners that when they get one-on-one -on -one situations that you can create mm -hmm. a bit more often in LSU, uh, that you just take advantage of that, especially yes. where he's able to throw the ball. I mean, their passing offense was built around the strengths of his game. I am more concerned about his plan versus pressure, as mm -hmm. you outlined. I mean, 51% of his yep. pressures ended in a pass. Like, that is unreal mm -hmm. numbers that we just do not see, you know? Right. And so that is an interesting translation to me that I do have a bit wary of. Let's put it that way. I will say he also was like number two or number three all time in total EPA this last okay. year. It's like him and Joe Burrow. Obviously, it helps to have Malik Neighbors and we'll get to Brian Thomas in a second, but he is a very high upside prospect as well, especially for fantasy. So I have the fifth pick in my dynasty league. I'm very happy to have one of these five guys. This is like a pretty rare quarterback class on top of the two wide receivers we just mentioned. Well, the tier continues. JJ McCarthy is next for me. Again, keep in mind, this is super flex. Um, he's coming from an NFL system into an NFL system. You know, he will play this year, in my opinion. This is an offense that will actually throw more than his offense did at the college level. You know, proportionally, when you think about it, statistically, percentage wise. Um, and that gets me excited because when you looked at where JJ McCarthy was at his best in college, it was throwing over the middle of the field into those tight windows, but it was also in those third and five plus situations. Well, we can translate that same third and five, third and seven, third and 12 scenarios that he had at the college level into first and first and 15 or second and 11 or second and eight. And I guarantee you what we have seen with Kevin O'Connell, especially this past season, when you're going from Kirk Cousins to Joshua Dobbs to Jaron Hall mm -hmm. to Nick Mullins. He changed his offense in ways to incorporate that team's or that player's strengths. Gigi McCarthy is far more talented than the final three 
that we yep. talked about. And I'm excited for him to uh, fit this offense with, you know, at least Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison healthy, plus other players like yep. Aaron Jones and TJ Hawkinson. Yeah, I think TJ Hawkinson will be a long-term guy there. Obviously, Addison and Jefferson for sure will be. And then the other thing to consider with McCarthy, indoor at home, and then that division, Lions, Packers, the Bears with Caleb Williams. I mean, this division long-term is going to be putting up ridiculous amount of points. I think it's going to be a very fantasy-friendly environment for J.J. McCarthy. And I think that people have underestimated just how athletic he is. He's a five-star guy from IMG Academy. He's won everywhere he goes. And he, on occasion, he'll scramble around, pick up some key first downs. He didn't have to do that very often because of the Michigan offense, but maybe there's a little bit more hidden upside uh, with his rushing ability as well. Next in Tier 2 is uh, Roma Dunze. And I actually have no notes here. I mean, I, I think Roma Dunze just fills in into that X wide receiver spot for this team. And, like, they have the three wide receivers to fill the three traditional spots extremely well. And DJ Moore being the movement motion guy and Keenan Allen, who has been in two wide receiver sets in the past. And we'll probably see some two wide receiver sets from mm -hmm. Shane Waldron. But uh, fills in the slot perfectly. I do not know the statistical upside of just this season. For Roma Dunze. I could see him being in a crazy world, the team's number one getter this year. Uh, he could also be number three very easily. But beyond this year, we don't know about the the strengths of Keenan Allen beyond 2024. And I, I think this link between Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze is uh potentially magical. Underdog Fantasy Pick'em Lobby has Roma Dunze at 750 yards for this rookie season, which seems about right. It's, a, it's definitely a tier or two below both Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison, which I think is justified based off of the rookie quarterback. We think Caleb's going to be very good, but lots of, a lot of mouse if he's Keenan Allen, one-year deal. I'm not expecting him to be a part of the plans long-term. We'll see if that's the case. Um, so hopefully we don't get a full JSN season like we had when, when he was de dealing with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. The difference between JSN and Roma Dunze to me as prospects is pretty substantial. Do you think I should have him either in the top tier with those other wide receivers, or do you think I should have him at the top of this list behind them? If I was going to be adjusting the tiers, I think that you can make a case that Drake may and Jaden Daniels should go up a tier uh, okay. with the other guys. Um, but yeah, I think if it's Jaden Daniels versus Roma Dunze, I think just look at your own roster. I think these guys are very highly rated. Um, Roma Dunze will be a, a stud long-term. Um, I think JJ McCarthy will be too. So if you're really desperate for quarterbacks, I would not blame you. If you went with one of the top guys, if you're set there, then I think that you can definitely take Roma Dunze. Uh, this is like a really solid top top seven. And more on that quarterback position in a little bit, uh, because I think it is a much larger dynasty fantasy football conversation than just about these prospects. And again, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, to close out this tier, Brock Bowers. Now the tight end of the Las Vegas Raiders. I know people are terrified of this situation. But situations, especially quarterbacks and play callers, can change in a single offseason. You know, what I see about Brock Bowers is he can fulfill on an offense how three other tight ends across the league have been utilized. And I think in this case, it's going to be Evan Ingram-ish, where it's going to be a lot of split flow work across the formation as the move guy and pick up yards after catch situations. Guess what? That's a massive area that he had at Georgia. I think he can do Sam Laporta stuff, but I don't know if, you know, Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell are quite Ben Johnson plus Jared Goff in those scenarios. Yeah. But at the same time, other than Devontae Adams on one side of the field, uh, you can also split out Brock Bowers and others on the other section. And that was a dynamic duo when it comes to condensed fields trying to match mm -hmm. up for defenses. Uh, again, I want you to look long-term here, and I think Brock Bowers is a very, very, very intriguing prospect that I'm way ahead of compared to Dalton Kincaid, who's also a round one tight end last year. Right. I think that's the way to approach this. In terms of adjusted production based off of his age and the school he went to, it was the best I've had all time. Now, the environment was unquestionably a bad spot for him to go among the more realistic spots just because Antonio Pierce wants to run the ball. Luke Getze is Luke Getze. We don't know what the quarterback situation is. Uh, we do know that Gardner Minshew's on a two-year contract there. So there's a lot of things to work out. Devontae Adams, though, his guaranteed money is gone after this year. So if Brock Bowers does well and then they get rid of Devontae Adams, all of a sudden he basically has no uh, target competition moving forward. So I think it's not the best landing spot for rookie season, but I think that long-term the upside 
uh, should hit. I think that that was a really good comparison between Evan Ingram. Lots of stuff in the flat, the yards after the catchability. Oh and I think that he just is more physical and like on seam routes to what Evan Ingram has shown. Um, but I think like that's what you're going to get at the very least. Evan Ingram, hopefully he finds a quarterback eventually as good as Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> and we talked about it a lot, how there's kind of this old guard at the tight end position and we're getting a whole bunch of injection of younger talent too. We saw it last year with Sam Laporta and a few others. Mm -hmm. Brock Bauer should be a part of that. And look, if you don't have a top five or top seven tight end in a lot of ways, then you're almost chasing points among tight ends. And in redraft, you can kind of punt that at sections. For me, Brock Bauer's the ascension into top five, top seven at the position is very clear. And again, I, I, I would uh, I would be willing to make him a top eight selection. And if you already have a quarterback, then I think you can push Roma Dunze and Brock Bowers ahead of this list. Do you know if he is like going after this list in the consensus dynasty ranking? Or is this kind of the, the conversation? Because I, I can see opinions being very split on him this at this point, just because he went to the Raiders. I have seen people be very terrified of really? the situation. Okay. Yeah. I think the playing it in the middle ground, like, like you did here is, is appropriate. Okay. Let's get into tier three. And for me, that is Bonex, the first player of the third tier. I see him going earlier mid round two in super flex science. He drafts wow. and he's my ninth overall player listed here. I don't get it. He's going to be the starter. In fact, let's hear from his new head coach, Sean Pate. Pay close attention to all the film study and, and, you know, obviously he's played a lot of football, but, you know, sack differential, turnover differential, um, accuracy, third down passing, first, 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 first in this class, first and end of half, first and end of game, two minute situation, second in red zone. Um, a lot of those other things that, uh, and then let's get, um, let's do another uh, passing statistic and remove a lot of the short underneath throws. And obviously that's part of what they do offensively and, and you remove that and you come back with the analytics and, and it's still first and he stole your notes Hayden he did what can go wrong here yeah I love this just because it is true like 97th percentile EPA per play among drafted quarterbacks that's Bo Nix it's hard to do that I don't care how old you are in the power five especially when we know his number one wide receiver doesn't go until the fourth damn round uh in the draft and then when you remove the screens and the RPOs he's still number one in all of these metrics so Something's got to give here, and I think this is the perfect opportunity for Bo Nix to play. I think he's going to start week one immediately, and then we'll see what they do. I think they're not going to completely dump Bo Nix uh, going into next year. They're going to try to right. surround him with wide receivers and stuff. So you're going to get like two, three, four years at the very least to me of somebody that's going to be starting games. And Sean Payton, when things are running right, fast pace, get the ball out, and really start uh, racking up uh, a bunch of stats. And to me, just looking at like 45 touchdowns, three interceptions, like, are we sure that this guy is terrible? I don't know. <laughs> so JJ Zacharyson had a great podcast episode on quarterback values after the rookie years. Oftentimes they, you know, go up, they appreciate, right? Yep. But in fact, even the ones that had rough rookie seasons, you still have a window to sell if, if you want to. Like round one quarterbacks are still going to start their second season in the NFL, no matter what. And fantasy managers are desperate for a starting quarterback in super flex leagues. So if you take him at the top of round two, I think the worst outcome you're going to get here is you're going to be able to sell him for a second round pick right. next at the same time. And the upside is you're going to get a guy that who was mm -hmm. should have been at the top of this tier again, the ninth overall selection. And I firmly believe that Sean Payton has zero patience left and that this is his guy. Yep. and that he is going to start and we are going to see production out of it. I would just understand how the value of the quarterback in the Superflex league is going to be greater than a lot of the tie of the wide receivers or tight ends or running backs that are going to be drafted mm -hmm. after him. So even if you don't need a quarterback here, I would still be taking Bo Nix and trying to flip that if you wanted to for next year draft capital. I think it's really smart. I think the other thing is People knew about Bo Nix and his struggles going back to Auburn. And I think that people get take locked onto that. And he's kind of become a meme because of how many bad decisions he was making at Auburn. They, those completely evaporated the, for, for two seasons in, in an offense uh, that was not like completely littered with first round talent, like some of the other quarterbacks on this list. So the, in terms of the production profile, and I think that he's a little bit better of an athlete than people want to give him credit for 
as well. I think this is like a, a lights out pick to make uh, on top of just him retaining the value long term. My 10th player, Ladd McConkey, Let's wide go. receiver for the LA Chargers. He's another one who's on like this fringe round one, sometimes fall into a few picks of round two. That surprises two. me. Wow. I mean, it's, sh it's shocking to me, Hayden. Like the number one thing that Jim Harbaugh has said about Ladd McConkey is that the quarterback knows where he's going to be and he is precise. Who else can you say that on the Chargers wide receiver roster that is locked in beyond this season? No one. I mean, to me, he instantly comes in and he's the best wide receiver on the team. Oh, yeah. And they're going to run the ball a lot and they've invested along the offensive line. But also, what is one of Ladd McConkey's best routes? The out route, right? Mm -hmm. Where is Justin Herbert? Lasers. Lasers to the sideline. Like, I think he and lad are just going to be instantly on the same page and this mm -hmm. is again a new regime that this is their only investment and they surely are not tied to anyone else so far and it's probably going to be a regime that's not going to completely go back to the well drafting more and more wide receivers especially because lad's profile he can win deep from the outside and then can go kick into the slot and go, go with like the classic uh option routes, slant routes, those type of things as well. So he just might be their chess piece for many, many years to come. And I know it's not the same exact offense, but like Keenan Allen finished seventh overall in fantasy points last year, 31st overall the year prior to that as Justin Herbert's number one guy. So I'm shocked. I don't even know what the case would be against Ladd McConkey to not have him in this tier. I guess it would just be kind of size paired with his injury history. Production, but all these guys... The question is production too. And Hayden, I, I, I would refer those people... To Lad McConkey had to do the dirty work, so Brock Bowers could get a lot of the easy work. To be honest, like Bowers had thirty screens back in last season, Lad McConkey had seven in twenty twenty two. Both had twenty one, but Bowers had fifty slot targets compared to just twenty five. Yeah. Lad McConkey again, this is a true inside outside player who's going to be out yeah. there. Like, I also think maybe the same people were attached to Quentin Johnson last year. And if you're utilizing and and thinking of Quentin Johnston when oh my uh, drafting Lad McConkey, then that is an incredible addiction to the bit. <laughs> it really is. Uh, also, by the way, number one in EPA per target, Lad McConkey last year in the Georgia offense. Come on, he plays with no fat in his game. I mean, his movements are so intentional. Yeah. Like four four speed too. I, I also think it's funny where I see like Roman Wilson's statistics and metrics highlighted and then Ladd McConkey's pushed down when those are now counterintuitive when <laughs> Ladd McConkey is in the offense where Roman Wilson had all of those numbers with a yeah. quarterback that is better and is going to be uh, the primary passing target in that yeah. same environment. So like, hey, let's just shove it in this direction yeah. for Ladd and not think of it with Roman anymore. Also, think about the guys he made Get out of there. Adonai Mitchell, see you later. Jermaine Burton, scared to compete. All these guys couldn't sniff Ladd McConkey's jock. He was the guy that all the Charger scouts targeted. They said he was a starter level grade. Guess what? He's going to be a starter unless yeah. injuries hit him. It's that simple. Oh, it's yeah. that simple. Okay. My 11th is Brian Thomas, the wide receiver for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, how they put it is that he is going to see more coverages, different defenses in the NFL. And those are the things as coaches we will scheme him up for. It's pretty easy to see what he did at LSU and we'll get him in here to see what he can do in our offense. So Hayden, to me, mm -hmm. that says we know that he can run hitches. We know where he can run goes. That might be the early stuff that we get him in on, but we're going to see how he bends, how he creates separation in his routes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the big question is, this team runs some multiple tight end sets. Is that going to be Christian Kirk and certainly Gabriel Davis? And when they go into three wide receiver sets, like how early can Brian Thomas crack like in every single down roll? I wouldn't be surprised if that's a, as a rookie. We'll see. I, I think that you and I viewed him slightly differently. Uh, I thought that there's a little bit more potential in it, like creating some branches to his route tree, but that's a little bit of a development. So we'll see how quickly that happens. Um, Gabe Davis hasn't really concerned me. I know that Gabe Davis is going to be on the field a ton, but I think there's a chance that Brian Thomas is too good to remove himself from two wide receiver sets, even if he's not quite as good of a blocker as Gabe Davis, though. Uh, I think kind of depends, like, Ladd McConkey versus Brian Thomas. Like, to me, that could be, like, half PPR versus full PPR between it, the two of them. Uh, but I think that his upside, like, this is still a hell of a tier. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Th this team, I think, knows how to utilize their talents quite well, despite what happened to Calvin Ridley last year because he was kind of forced into that. 
and they signed Gabriel Davis. Again, this is just my opinion to be the downfield X stuck along the sideline to kind of create more space underneath. And the underneath people were obviously going to be Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram. But most importantly, the movement guy was going to be Calvin Ridley. We saw Brian Thomas in the past mostly work in that same straight line. But I wonder, again, if we have these roles, and I'm turning them very binary right now, if Brian Thomas is actually going to be tried out in kind of a movement way and get the ball in his hands a bit more often, which is, again, mm -hmm. very, very, very different than what we mm -hmm. saw him at LSU. But it could work. His athleticism yeah. is definitely there. Yeah. I think long-term, he's going to be a, a superstar. By the way, if your rankings are different, let us know in the comments down below. I'm sure there are. Uh, and also, while you're here, hit that subscribe button. Thumbs up. We appreciate everyone that has joined us during NFL draft season. But we have so much more of a best ball summer and fantasy yeah. football summer ahead uh, over the next coming months. We had, I think, like 200,000 new viewers this this month. So if you're new to the channel, subscribe to us. We'll be dumping out fantasy football content uh, for, for a very, very long time. Okay. Number 12, I have Panthers running back Jonathan Brooks. This is another name Ooh. that I see bouncing into round two quite often in certain leagues out there. Let's hear from actually uh, Panthers head coach Dave Canales. First and foremost, you know, our system calls for a back that could be uh, used, of course, just in a traditional way, hand it to him. Then how can we get this player in space, um, being able to get him in perimeter screens, check downs. We got a really cool empty package where we use the backs, flex them out to get matchups, things like that. Um, you know, he's a bigger back. He's got range. Um, there's there's so much that he brings from a versatility standpoint. That's probably the biggest thing that stood out. And then just vision, patience contact balance, um, acceleration, like he's got it all. He's the best back in this class. And we were so fired up to just be able to bring him in um, and create that competition that Dan talked about. And it's pretty simple. I mean, I think Jonathan Brooks, I know he's coming off an ACL, is going to be the primary running back for yeah. this team early. I mean, think about it. Chuba Hubbard, final year of his contract. Miles Sanders, they can't wait to get rid of him because of Deuce Staley and Frank Reich and Scott Fitter and all that type of stuff. And as Dave said, checklist this is exactly what we talked about Jonathan brooks he's a check by almost everything except mm -hmm. ridiculous explosion which is fine you have to get to the yeah. third level to get there uh and i think that he's he's not bad in that metric nope. i think he's just he's fine. almost one speed when canals was talking through that like immediately you're like rashad white rashad white he was an rb1 last year and like not the best environment like i think that jonathan brooks is should be a first rounder all day long and the reports uh, and this has been the kind of the, the drum beat even going back to around the combine He's aiming for July 1st, and he's on track to be ready for contact on July 1st. So I'm not ruling out the first snap of the Panthers season being Jonathan Brooks as the RB1. I mean, Canales also said that running the ball is non-negotiable. This team's going to run the ball. I mean, they just signed yeah. two guards to massive money on top Huge. of that. And again, Brooks, smooth, powerful, efficient decision maker, has dynamic movements when he needs them, strong movements when called upon. I think people are underestimating how involved Jonathan Brooks is going to be immediately on this team next still in this tier the last name number 13 xavier worthy wide receiver kansas city chiefs worthy i think is going to impact this team more in like real football than maybe week to week production in fantasy football in terms of just volume of targets because we've talked about this his speed with marquise brown they haven't really had that especially with two players at the same time and that kind of allows to me the volume opportunistic ones over the middle of the field to create more space for them in Travis Kelsey and Rasheed Rice when he mm -hmm. comes back. But that's not to say that I'm not a fan of Xavier Worthy's game. I absolutely am. I think he is tougher than people give him credit for. He's more of a dog and he's more willing to work over the middle of the field than I think people when they see a 42140 would expect. Yeah, and Hollywood's going to be here for one season. They're not going to be able to afford him. And then Travis Kelsey, he got this like two-year extension. But if you actually look at it, it's basically just a one-year raise. And they throw some extra money on there, but it's an all-player option. So we'll see if Travis Kelsey wants to hang around after this season as well. So if you get rid of those two guys, it's just, just him versus Rasheed Rice. And for my money, I think Xavier Worthy is a tier above Rasheed Rice in terms of just how, like, how talented they are. So we'll see how, how it goes. Lots of mouths to feed this year. But I think long-term, all of a sudden, you're going to clear out two of the four names that we're dealing with. And I think that Xavier Worthy has this tempo, pacing, stop, start ability. Uh, and Andy Reid obviously knows how to use this type of weapon. So I think long-term, this is going to be a smash success for the Chiefs. Yeah. And obviously when Andy Reid and Deshaun Jackson 
had some great moments. There was less too high co cover two looks. And so you could get right. those one-on-ones a bit more often. Um, did love that Andy Reid said that Xavier Worthy loves football and he can run all day. And I'm sure he was looking for that when evaluating wide receivers compared to the uh, Kadarius Tony and other wide receiver experiments that they've had recently. Sure. I don't even think when he mentioned wide receivers, he even brought up Sky Moore, Kadarius Tony's name one time. Like, yeah. I think that they have moved past and they're a distant memory this offseason. Yeah. The bit of calling Kadarius Tony the most talented wide receiver on the team for the third straight years was going to start bombing. Okay. Start of tier four, 14th overall pick for me. Michael Penix Jr. It goes back to what we were talking about with quarterbacks, right? And the value they bring. And this is a tricky one, more tricky than Bo Nix oh, yeah. for sure. And like, if you don't want to wait a year or two and just to let that go by, totally just bypass this pick. Totally. Um, I can't escape though, Hayden, the eighth overall selection. And I understand a hundred gar million guaranteed, but like, I would be stunned if he does not get starts in 2025 yeah this one makes me nervous i i i also like on top of just like the the fit in terms of compared to kirk cousins i also thought michael Penix was a second round guy like that was just my evaluation well of they him. don't they think no, he's I, awesome i understand that but i think that most people thought that he was more of a second round type and i'm not sure if he has like the the we haven't seen him right. translate his athletic traits into like where the fantasy points are and it's really hard for me to tell like Okay, let's say it's 2025, 2026. Like, who the hell is going to be coaching? Who's going to be around him in, at that point? So, yeah, I, I think if you're desperate for quarterbacks, I would I would understand rolling the dice. But um, to me, it's it's not even desperation necessarily. It's almost more of an investment, I think, because we've talked about how the contract to me basically puts Michael Penix Jr. as a starter in 2026, right? right. So, like, that is the target. Stuff can happen in between there when Michael Michael Penix gets starts or just balls out in the preseason like he's almost certainly going to be the mm -hmm. starter in preseason games this year. And I want to add, every single player we're going to talk about after this has like at least one flaw, if not right. more than that. Right. And again, I think in super flex drafts, if Michael Penix does not play this year and if you are set at quarterback, I think someone's going to have in their mind because they're desperate of, oh, I can invest in Michael Penix in the 2025 offseason because then I'm going to have a starter mm -hmm. the next year. So again, you're going to have to spend, and I've seen him go late second round, maybe a late to mid second round pick here for, again, earlier picks the following year, or you just keep him. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a starter in 2026 at the very latest. The other pessimistic angle that I just thought about is what happens if things go sideways the next two years and Terry Fondo's fired Zach Robinson and Raheem Morris. They're also fired. Then all of a sudden this new regime's like, why do we care about Michael Penix again? Um, so that's, this is a very complicated one. So we'll see if there's any other names that intrigue me. Well, that is extremely pessimistic for a coach and an offensive coordinator that have not even been on the field at the same <laughs> time so far. <laughs> well, yeah, all of a sudden Arthur makes gets uh, less patient. Okay. Once the Kirk cousin experience dries up, we'll see what happens there. My second player in the fourth tier is Panthers wide receiver Xavier Leggett. Let's again hear from head coach Dave Canales on how they plan to use him. First of all, just the athletic traits, right? Just like height, weight, speed, you know, 6'1", 221, 439, you know, really balanced hands. Um, that's a pretty good start. You know, then you look at the versatile ways that the Gamecocks were able to use him out of the backfield jet sweeps, short crossers, perimeter screens, down the field posts. There really isn't much else we do with receivers. He's he's done it all. So I know that Bryce Young is not Patrick Mahomes, but I think that Xavier Leggett's rookie season is going to be very similar to Rasheed Rice's, plus more downfield routes on top of it. Yeah, that's how I kind of used him. Uh He's not Debo Samuel, but they would use him in Debo Samuelish ways back in college, and he's at least has the size and the the speed to make do on that. So, yeah, this is a very boom bust selection. Like this is like to your point with Michael Penix. Like this thing could easily fall out in, in two ways. That Leggett just he wasn't able to work on his hands enough, wasn't able to polish up with his route running, or Bryce Young doesn't pan out over the next couple of years, or he's 
221 pounds and run 439. Everything really clicks there. So this is the boom bust tier. I think there's a huge drop off to me from the B tier of players that you listed into the C tier. Again, shallow crosses, post routes. I mean, this past year, if you go back and watch the North Carolina game or a whole bunch of others, sensational contested catch because he just out athletes every other player across from him. Mm -hmm. They have a plan for this. I mean, Dave Knauss was with DK Metcalf when he came into the league. I'm not saying that Xavier Leggett is going to be DK Metcalf, mm -hmm. but at least we saw DK Metcalf early in his career and Knauss was there for the entire time have certain roles and just certain aspects and limit him to what he can do. And then we saw it yeah. expand from there, you know, yeah. again, not saying that they are going to end up being the same player, but I think the pathway has already been cleared and trailed right. that they're going to utilize Xavier Liga in the same way. To me, it's also like, that's a good understanding of the prospect. He is, yes. I think like that makes me a little bit more confident. Like they have a plan. They, they understand his pros and his cons and not just like completely dreaming about the upside at all times. 16th, Trey Benson, running back, Arizona Cardinals. He's a playmaking running back. Speed, versatility, power. They said he's a big man who can run fast. <laughs> he is. <laughs> From Jonathan Gannon, can you break tackles? Yes. Can you make people miss? Yes. Can you hit home runs? Yes. He does all of these things. And yeah. I don't think James Conner is going anywhere in 2024 unless he gets injured, which we have seen him do in the past. And then in 2025, and heck, parts of 2024, Trey Benson can be the home run hitter for this offense that, again, Drew Petzing, design, and now has already added another piece in Marvin Harrison mm -hmm. Jr. Explosive plays are tough to come by, and he might be one of their most explosive players. Yeah, this is somebody I probably would slide ahead Penix personally just because after this year, he's going to be the established guy. Now, the con to Trey Benson's game is he has never been like a true bell cow. He's always been with somebody. So we'll see if he's able to handle that obviously he's coming off of this humongous knee dislocation but it's many years past him and he's still an incredible athlete be best quads and legs in the draft no question about it and i think that long term him and kyler this could be a pretty fun combo um and I, there's a chance that james connor goes down uh this offense it was hammering runs to james yeah. connor last year he's like a top 40 player overall so i think that even for this year there is some contingent upside but i think long term he will be the foundation back 17th rookie for dynasty drafts for me bills wide receiver keon coleman i know for many he'll top the tier right here but i want to listen to what brandon bean said their plan for him is and then let's talk about it it's all ball and i think josh um, knows that we're going to need him to get up to speed and we're going to be counting on him early in his role sometimes you're bringing in rookies and you're just saying hey you know, barring injury, you're probably not going to start, you know, help us on special teams or something else like that. Uh, in this case, you know, it's no secret we needed to add, you know, a guy like him to, to fill this X role that, that that's vacant. And um, so that's part of the what you're considering. And, and you know, we're not going to try to push him too fast, but we're going to press him. And, and we think we got good guys in the room. So two sides of that. One, he's going to play early. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, Has and to. He's, he's super young, but he's going to play early Two. I hear X, a role that we have to fill. I get nervous about Keon Coleman mm -hmm. down the field creating separation because it was already a struggle at the college level. Based on our eyes, based on Matt mm -hmm. Harmon's charting, based on whoever's watching him, it turned into a whole bunch of contest situations which can go either way. And so that is concerning to me. It is a little concerning. I, I would have liked him in the slot role, but the fallback, if you are going to play X receiver, doing it in Josh Allen's offense seems... Uh, something I want to chase there. So he's going to be into like the Gabe Davis ish role. And that was actually one of my comps if he was going to play this role. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I think that some of the contested catch stuff with Keon Coleman was a desperation out of the quarterback at Florida state, just heaving up passes that had no business going his way. So we'll, we'll see what, what things look like. All I know is if he does hit, you are going to love Keon Coleman. Cause what a hell of an interview and character that guy is. So, um, we'll see. And then the fallback, maybe in a year from now, when Curtis Samuel's out of there and they've given up on Khalil Shakir, maybe he kicks back inside a little bit more. <laughs> you are trying to break down an offense that was already broken down this offseason. Well, I, I was just saying, like, if he doesn't work out at X receiver, he can go kick back inside long term, too. So we'll see what happens there. This guy, this guy has the, the alpha personality that we're looking yeah. for at this position. Again, I just go back to, and I'm not talking about contested catch numbers. I'm not talking about any of this, just percentage wise. There was a period where you caught one of 11 and you should have caught more of those um, in games two, three, four of last season. But 
just the like total lack of separation down the field. Like, can he, because as Brandon Bean talked about, as you and I talked about in our pre-draft profile, we actually liked him earlier in routes more than later on in routes. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of extended routes down the field and scramble drills, all that stuff. And maybe he, he can improve in that area, but it's just concerning to me of someone who didn't do it in college, then changing it and doing yep. it in the NFL. Last name in this tier, 18th rookie for me is Ricky Pearsall, who I loved pre-draft. You loved him peer draft, uh, pre-draft as well. Um, my concern is that the 49ers were second to last in the league this past season and 11 personnel at just 40%. Mm -hmm. And so we already know that with a 49ers team, uh, when everyone is healthy, Debo, CMC, Ayuk, George Kittle, all of them can't hit. At least one of them is just going to sit out that game, basically production-wise. And if all of them are in place and healthy in 2024, that means Ricky Pearsall is the fifth, and that yeah. means there's going to be very little production in that for me. A couple outs, though. Debo Samuel is a trade candidate. I think this offseason is still on the table. Certainly next year when they're looking to pay Brandon Ayuk, Debo, trading Debo Samuel will become something 100%. that will definitely be at the top of the list. And then George Kittle is like, what, already 31 years old? We'll see how much longer where he's this true elite status. Same thing with Christian McCaffrey, who's not some young guy as well. So for this year, if nobody's trading and stuff, yeah, it's going to be a problem for Ricky Pearsall. But in two years from now, you could right. be the number two receiver uh, for an established Brock Purdy that's not going to go anywhere. Kyle Shanahan's not going to go anywhere. And at that point, I think that Ricky Pearsall has plenty enough juice to be a slot wide receiver. But I do think that he's kind of around that fringe because he is so good with ball tracking and his speed that maybe he could be a vertical guy as well. I saw him got pushed around a little bit out there. But I think for the most part, in two years from now, three years yep. from now, just knowing I'm going to tank this rookie season for that upside later could be worthwhile. Yeah. Again, I think he's layering this list because you almost certainly are going to get a tanked rookie year unless something happens like what you're suggesting. Yep. Uh, I love Ricky Pearsall. I think they want him to be a two wide receiver set player. Yep. And it would be fascinating to move on from Debo, who again, zone numbers are fantastic. What he does in this offense, no one exactly would be able to replicate. But if that's the case, then you have two man-to-man -man beaters in Brandon Ayuk and Ricky Pearsall. And maybe that yeah. is the vision that mm -hmm. Kyle Shanahan wants to have moving forward for the 49ers offense. That would make sense. He's good enough for that. He is. Okay. Tier 5. We start off with 19th ranked player. For me, that's Jalen Polk, now of the New England Patriots. Again, I want to mention that he and Javon Baker have been working out together this whole process. They did a couple of throwing sessions with Drake May. For me, Polk, really tough, strong, competitive, even after the catch, can run all the routes inside and outside. They mm -hmm. said do everything. They spent time with him at the Senior Bowl, at the Combine, so they didn't need to bring him in for a visit. Robert Woods is the example yeah. I'm going to keep bringing up over and over. And I think a Robert Woods-esque player attached to Drake May, uh, that's slightly different than Josh Downs, but you can see the vision. And Josh Downs was extremely productive attached to May during their 2023 season at UNC. 2022, excuse me. And I viewed Polk as a very high floor prospect yes. as well. So if we can get Robert Woods upside with one of the highest floor second round wide receiver prospects of the last couple of years, I think that's worthwhile. Obviously, you have to kind of parlay this with Drake May's got to be good. Angela Polk's got to be good. But at this point, I think that we're, we're both pretty confident that Polk's a player and we think that Drake May is a player as well. And there's that room still like Kendrick Bourne, Juju, all these guys. It's, it's not, a, it's not a whole lot to compete with over there. No, he should be playing immediately. I mean, that is his game. We thought like it should translate exactly what he did at the college level goes mm -hmm. straight to the NFL. Okay. Next for me, Adnan Mitchell wide receiver. All right. From the Colts. All he has to do is be better than Alec Pierce. <laughs> And he's also so much better in the red zone. In fact, let's hear head coach Shane Syke and talk about him. Rare ability to separate at the top of routes. Um, he's got an arsenal um, of releases. First press man, you can see it show up on tape. I mean, the guy had 11 touchdowns. I think he averaged 14.4 yards a catch. Um, the guy's a competitor. Uh, to get him where we got him, I couldn't be more fired up about it. And hats off to Chris and his staff. Um, to add to that room with Pittman and Downs and Alec and Ashton and the rest of those guys, uh, he's going to bring that speed element and that big playability to as well. We think Shane Sykin's a good coach, Hayden. He uh oh, yeah. he loves him. Oh some yeah. AD Mitchell. I mean they they play really fast and Anthony Richardson, they know that they want to throw the ball way downfield. And he's the answer. Like Josh Downs can do that at times, Michael Pim can do that at times, but Adam Mitchell, that is his bread and butter is winning 
stay on the field. And we've seen it at flashes. The releases are one thing. The ability to break out of his breaks is another thing that maybe there's a guy that can tr turn into a true number one, somebody that could be the first read on RPOs once he kind of gets more established and Michael Pittman kind of phases out of this offense. So a uh, boom bust just because he's a first round guy that went round two, we can see where this slope could end up at. But the peak of Adonai Mitchell to me would be better than Ricky Pearsall, Xavier Leggett, and Jalen Polk in this type of tier. So you're kind of paying for it. And I think that there's enough volume in this offense because uh, Shane Sykin wants to play so fast where even if he is the number two behind Michael Pittman for the first couple of years, that still could be enough, especially in half PPR. I forgot this, but Reggie Wayne is their wide receivers coach. They believe Reggie Wayne's a great match for him to help him kind of acclimate to the NFL. And I love this. They're not expecting him to be Superman right away. We've talked about a bunch of receivers that have to be the primary or secondary mm -hmm. option. I mean, Adam I Mitchell can be the third, do what you do really well, yeah. put work in the lab, figure out what the NFL cycle is all about. And then in year two, if you hit the ground running and you are somewhat of a different player or, you know, the final three or four weeks of your rookie season two, mm -hmm. we could start seeing like a real yeah. liftoff because I think the talent definitely is there for that. And this is also another way to get exposure to Anthony Richardson, too, who yeah. you and I believe could be an MVP candidate very soon. Very soon. 21st rookie for me, Jermaine Burton, Ooh. wide receiver, Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, let's hear from his head coach, Zach Taylor. Play strength matter, especially, you know, in our division, you, you don't get a lot of free free access, you know, the, the way this division plays out. And so there, there's plenty of guys that with clean air out there can run fast, go track down the field. We need guys that can play physical and create separation and have strong hands at the catch point. And um, you want to talk about Jermaine specifically, um, you can see him run all sorts of routes from all positions. You see him make contested plays on the field. You see him run away from people down the field. You see no drops on tape this year. Didn't see a single one. Um and so, and you saw run after the catch. You saw great scramble awareness, get in phase with quarterback, and and create big plays on scrambles. And um, so, I just think that he's got the ability to to really add to the competition in that room. I, I'm really excited. We obviously have have two set and stone starters with Jamar Chase and T Higgins, and and now we've got you know Jermaine and and Andre and Charlie that we took last year, Trent Irwin, who has always continued to to find roles and ways to help us with this team. And and then there's there's the guys behind them as well, you know. And so it's just a really deep room there's going to be opportunity for all those guys. And, and I'm excited to see how it all plays out. These head coaches are stealing your notes, Hayden. Jermaine Burton, I swear, this guy, if he hits, he's really going to hit. And what a perfect landing spot. Uh, TJ Hushmanzada announcing the pick is his mentor, obviously going to Cincinnati is going to help him there. Go learn under Joe Burrow. The structure of this locker room is right there. And T Higgins, he's not going to be a Bengal after this year, just the way the Bengals view their contract situation. There's not going to be able to afford the guaranteed money for T Higgins. So if Jermaine Burton is as good as I think he is and as Zach Taylor thinks he is, then Jermaine Burton can be Joe Burrow's number two target next year. I mean, that is as clean of an upside path as possible. And I think that he nailed it in terms of the scouting profile. He can win deep, very fast, reliable hands down there. Ball tracking was good. But to me, there was a couple times where we would catch an in-breaking route and absolutely truck the safety and then walk into the end zone. So there's a little bit more physicality to this vertical only profile that I'm definitely intrigued with. So can I throw a scenario out there? Please. Let's say Jalen Polk fell to the third round and he was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals. I would be more in on immediate production from Jalen Polk than I am for Jermaine Burton because sure. this, and who knows what they're going to do with Jamar Chase. Like we have seen him move around quite a bit more, especially with Joe Burrow's injury in you know recent years and just how defenses were playing them. At points, it felt like we just got like two outside wide receivers with Tyler Boyd in the slot. And again, they moved Jamar Chase around a bit more often, but like Jermaine Burton and Tyler Boyd are just very different types. So we're going to have to see almost a transition of that third wide receiver from this team mm -hmm. that I think someone like Jalen Polk would have fit in better for that. So I think Jermaine Burton outside of splash plays uh, should be viewed more as a 2025 selection more mm -hmm. so than a 2024 one. But I think in like second round of rookie drafts, you're not looking to start these guys as no. rookies all the time. So I think that there's there's definitely room for him to sit on your bench for this year and figure it out later. But I think that compared to like if, if you're a guy that's really into draft capital, like Jermaine Burton getting third round draft capital to me is a massive win. There yeah. was DMs that were thinking that he could fall out of the draft completely because so many teams had him off the board. Like the fact that he he got a third round draft capital is to me a massive sign for him. He has much more upside than the classic third round pick. Okay, 22 for me is actually the running back three. The fourth in this tier, it's Blake Corum. 
Rams running back. This is a high ranking compared to probably consensus really? out there. And it's not because I think he's destined to replace Kyron Williams outright. It's because the Rams view him as a similar player to Kyron Williams. In fact, let's hear from Sean McVay on that. To me, one of the things that jumped off is there's a lot of traits that reminded me of Kyron Williams. You know, obviously I love Kyron and he's been so important and just, you know, the human being, but then also when you just look at the way he works at it, the production and the things that he was able to bring to our offense last year, and even really some of the things that he worked through his rookie year. And I think there's a lot of similarities. Obviously, Kyron will put Blake under his arm and, and be a great mentor and a kind of a leader. But Ron Gould was really excited about him, Mike LaFleur. Um, I obviously love his game. And so um, he's got a bunch of you know tape to be able to evaluate. He's been a part of an incredibly successful program. So I, I don't think that this is an indication that the Rams are just going to move on from Kyron Williams. And I think some people might interpret it that way. Sean McVay loves him, some Kyron Williams. Oh yeah. Um, and if the money's right though, I think they'll bring him back after this rookie deal. Um, but man, just visualizing what Blake Corum did at Michigan of being concise with his footwork, zero fat to his movements, picking up the yards blocked for him, running under center, an NFL mm -hmm. style offense. Again, if something happens to Kyron or just spelling him for this year, in an offense that is awesome, uh, I wanted to be ahead of the public on someone like Blake Corm here. I mean, what is the public thinking? That's, I mean, that's my question here. It Kyron Williams was the second best fantasy asset last year. Period. If if he's out for a couple games this next year, we will all be ranking Blake Corum as a top ten running back. So if that upside, like he'll, he'll be a top twenty overall asset for chunks of the season. If that comes in the fantasy playoffs, all of a sudden you've hit absolute jackpot and Kyron Williams as much as we love him he's not like the superstar runner out there as well and he's tiny and he's handles a lot of work so he can easily break down and I've watched Blake Corm touch the ball 35 times uh a game as well so we know that he can handle a workload as well so like for me the second where I'm like I'm not going to be starting these guys as a rookie what's the upside path I would rather take the lottery ticket of that Blake Corm could be. And I think that the evaluation is exactly right. Like his vision, instincts, decision-making, especially in this downhill rushing style. And if that's where you look at what the McVay was doing and the free agency that they have with their offensive linemen, like this fits like player to team fit yeah. could not be more ideal for Blake Corm. In fact, and I, I know people don't like to draft running back insurance or handcuffs on their own roster and redraft. If you have Kyron Williams on your dynasty roster, getting Blake Corum just means you have that entire backfield. So if something yes. does happen to one of them, you're getting someone who is going to get 20 plus touches in any, any given week. Yep. Yeah. The only downside here is that McVay or uh, Matthew Stafford could be gone the next two years, oh. and we'll see if McVay wants to hang around after that as well. But I think like for this year, like there's there will there could be a week where you and I talk about him as the running back six, and that's hard to find this late in the draft. Jalen Wright is up next as my 23rd rookie. Simply put, Hayden, I think that this is the Raheem Mostert replacement after this year. It certainly yeah. clouds Devon Achan's opportunity projection this year because it turns a two-person backfield into a three-person because, you know, we can throw Jeff Wilson to the wind. But I would be stunned if Jalen Wright carves out a massive role this year. But let's look ahead to an offense that utilizes speed and is able to package that and find perfect ways for it. And the Miami Dolphins and Jalen Wright is a good fit in that department. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. They they gave up a lot to make sure that he was on the roster as well. So the draft capital is a little bit later than I think some people wanted for, but he got bailed out by the perfect landing spot. Yeah. And then some of our film evaluations uh, just get minimized because of the offense that he goes to. You just kind of get point and shoot and let the speed take over. 24, Patriots wide receiver J. Von Baker. Uh, if he comes in, has a good OTAs, good camp, he's almost certainly their starting X wide receiver. Mm -hmm. um, he is already good at creating separation. He's a dog after the catch. He makes difficult grabs. Again, he had throwing sessions with Drake May already. Uh, this is a pretty big gap compared to uh, Jalen Polk, Adonai Mitchell, Jermaine Bur Burton, and then to putting two running backs. So it's almost like a mini tier inside of okay. this tier. Um, but I was also a fan of Baker's at UCF. Mm -hmm. He's got upside for uh, early fourth round pick. And I, I am with you. If you look at the Patriots depth chart, there's a lot of names there. But it's a lot of guys that you want the flanker role or inside in the slot. There's not many guys you're like, all right, this guy's going to be the guy to go face press man coverage and win. And we'll see if Javon Baker's 
going to be able to do that a little bit inconsistent to me, but the flashes are there. And like, this is the specific role that he played at Alabama and at UCF. So I, I can envision the upside. I am with you that he has more traits than like the classic fourth round pick. I will say he and the next two names, I think it is dependent on what position you need. And I'll get to that here with the next name in Marshawn Lloyd, the running back with the Green Bay Packers, who I think is DeAndre Swift-ish, but with less draft capital, with worst draft capital. Um, I think he brings a different element to this offense, some big plays probably, maybe some Ty J Spear stuff to Josh Jacobs, Derrick Henry. What are your thoughts here? Because the Packers gave so much to Josh Jacobs, even when they had Aaron Jones. So they're obviously committed to him at a high level. Mm -hmm. But Marshawn Lloyd brings a totally different element than like A.J. Dillon or really any other back that they've had on this roster. Yeah, he's going to be more of the lightning style. And I think that A.J. Dillon, we should pretend like he's not even part of this. Same. Uh, I think that if Jacobs goes down, it will be Marshawn Lloyd. Um, So we'll see. The good news with him is he's attached to Jordan Love in this offensive line in LaFleur for long term. And that that to me is going to be a top five ish offense for like the next four or five years. Um, so I think he's in a good spot for like touchdowns and stuff. And he's got the size to make do on it. And maybe it's not the worst thing to go learn under Josh Jacobs. He's one of the best decision makers, really reliable physical rusher. Maybe Marshawn Lloyd can take a couple of notes uh, for the first year or two anyways. From LaFleur, quote, gives us a different flavor out of the backfield in one-on-ones. He can be a weapon out of the backfield, can run routes out of there. Um, Gudukuns was asked about his fumbles. Uh, fumbles were not an overly concerning thing for us. We view it as correctable. They did an analytic study of hand size and fumbles, and that does not track. They are not correlated. It's all right. Something to think about. Shout out to uh, the we'll nerds. see when he fumbles what happens if LaFleur wants to keep him. <laughs> okay. I mentioned that it's dependent on what position you might take. And that's because I have Washington commanders tight end Ben Sinnott. I thought you were going to say a kicker. No. <laughs> I mean, question is who is the tight end one in Washington? Like this is exactly the type of profile we want to attack at the tight end position, athletic mid round pick and invest in that. When Adam Peters gets up there and says he reminds him of Kyle Juszczyk and George Kittle and the way that he blocks, having the same mindset, you can line him up from any spot and ask him to accomplish his assignment as a blocker. And guess what? If you look at his athletic profile, if you look at his receiving skills at Kansas State, he can beat man coverage and he will be nasty after the catch. Mm -hmm. So it might not be in year one, but this is, again, the exact type of profile I love to bring in in Dynasty ahead of ADP and wait it out a year or two, and the upside is there. Zach Ertz is on a one-year, $2 million guaranteed contract. That's backup money there. So I think there's a path to starts as a rookie, especially Zach Ertz has been through a lot of injuries. and definitely Didn't even play last side. year. Right. So I, I think there's a chance that Ben Sinat could be somebody that's in the mix I, like I just did my best ball rankings, which are live on underdog network. And he's in my late round tight end, like aggressive tier in the one seventies. So not in the redraft leagues, but in like a little bit of a deeper league. I think that he's like straight up draftable this year in the app productions, there, athleticism there, almost like Kyle use check fullbacky vibes. I'm not yep. sure if that's the number 34 Jersey and like the way that they would kind of leak him out of the backfield, but he's kind of got this like creativity to his game. Uh, so hopefully cliff Kingsbury is the one to unlock it. Okay, two more names on this tier. Troy Franklin is 27th for me. I was not the biggest fan of Troy Franklin at Oregon. I felt he really struggled in tight window targets, struggled in working through contact in his routes, struggled with physicality. The NFL agreed. (laughs) I mean, I I still think he was more valuable than a fourth-round pick. Uh, I think the Broncos kind of mentioned that they had a second-round grade on him. It does help that Sean Payton is going to utilize him as more of a Z, more of a movement guy, as a vertical player. But I also think like that is quite different than a team viewing him as like a secondary piece of the passing game and spending mm-hmm. a second round draft capital on him. Yeah, I would also throw in his hands and ball tracking was pretty hit and miss, which is very key for this position. So he's really young and he was still very productive despite those flaws. So I think that he sh- should have gone late second, third round uh, somewhere in there. But the fourth round draft capital makes them uh, where if, he, if he's not sh- sh- kind of balling out, he cannot see the field very often there's josh reynolds Cortland sutton marvin mims tim patrick like those aren't like incredible names but i would not be surprised if you didn't see the field 
uh, immediately. And remember, they traded up for Marvin Moon. So I don't think it's very good. But last year with earlier draft capital, I think they're going to be kind of competing for the same role. Like it's undersized guys running fast as you can downfield. This might shock you, but Troy Franklin's going ahead of a whole bunch of names before this. Uh, people are sticking to pre-draft evaluations more so than what do it. they have in the past, I think. Just can't do that. Can't do mm. it. Got to make, got to make some adjustments. Um, real quick, I should have said this earlier. Best Ball Mania is here. Oh my goodness. Drafting is here. It's in the app. It's in the lobby right mm -hmm. now. If you've never played Best Ball, now is the time to do so. Producer Weave's going to throw a map on the screen. If you're in one of these yellow states and you've never played best ball before, you've only heard about it, you're like, what is this? Well, get in right now. Now is the time to do it. Click the link in the description. We will match a portion of your deposit that you put in so you can start drafting and then draft for the entire summer because it's going to be an enjoyable venture for you. I got to hit on a couple more notes with it. Best one mania, $15 million in total prizes. First place gets $1.5 million. Very flat payout structure, which is very popular. We've got a lot of good notes with that. We also have a $500 entry tournament called the Big Dog, which is a million dollar tournament. And then the Eliminator, which is a very fun. You get eliminated every single week, depending on how you finish all the way through the end. So it's a fin fantastic sweat out there and more different contest types are coming. It's a big priority for us. More contest variety price points. So right now we have a $10 tournament, a $25 tournament, a $500 tournament. We'll fill out the in-between as uh, the season goes on. So truly never better of time to be on the underdog right. app than right Again, now. Again, I'm, I'm sure you've heard us blabbing about best ball. Uh, if you never played it, the summer of 2024 is the time to do it. It's that yeah. simple. Try it we'll once. You. Try it one time. Okay. Uh, 28. Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver Roman Wilson. Um, the Falcons were last in the league in 11 personnel last season, Hayden at 17%. Now it's arguable if the team even has three starting wide receivers. Uh, and in fact, Arthur Smith, and that's the reason I brought up the Falcons last year is because Arthur Smith is now calling plays for the Steelers. Mm -hmm. uh, he has inside out flexibility, a lot of instincts, high football character guy. Roman Wilson sees himself as Tyler Lockett, expand his game to be inside out flex quote. He's battle tested on the interior parts in the field. So I think right. again, as we talked about deep play action, one side of the field to the other, that is the name of his game. I have major questions on if he's going to be a legit two wide receiver set player, but yeah. you kind of have to be to be productive in Arthur Smith offense, I feel. And I do think that he has kind of like the fringe traits to do it, depending on the offense. I would like to see him in the slot more, but Michigan was heavy two tight end sets and he was out there for all the snaps in them. So yeah, I think he does have a little bit of dog in him. He's not like the pristine route runner. In my opinion, he's got like talk about like just catch radius compared to Tyler Lockett. It's like not even close to me, but this is going to be a heavy play action offense, yep. deep crossing routes. And I do think that's kind of where his best traits line up because he has like a run away from you speed four, three, nine or whatever it was. So yeah. And in other offenses, I'd be like, he's not playing on the outside in this one. I actually do think he's got a chance to do that at least for this first year. Cause he's competing with Van Jefferson. I mean, come on. Okay. I would do my best to trade everything to get into the top 28 overall selections. Cause to me, there's a massive teardrop after this. You are really just throwing darts on either situations or traits or what have you. So from here on out, this can be ranked in any order. I did want to put it in an order for you. And it's going to start again with our tier six, 29th, Ray Davis. Running I like back. this. Yes. I mean, for the Buffalo Bills, who is the inside the 10 yard back? You know, as much as they put James Cook on the field last year and trusted him and was a very valuable member on this offense when Kendorsey was there and when Joe Brady was calling plays, yeah. they still took him out for Latavius Murray or Leonard Fournette in certain situations yeah. or Ty Johnson and others, yeah. you know? So it would be somewhat stunning to me if after we saw in the first two seasons of his career, James Cook then just develop into this also inside the 10 yard lines pounder mm -hmm. where... Brandon Bean got on the desk and said that he brings a violent and physical edge to the group. Uh, to me, that sounds like yep. a touchdown score. Yeah, this is like the exact role that you have to envision Ray Davis going into. The question is, is he good enough to be the Damian Harris or the Latavius Murray? And I, I, I didn't love his tape, being honest, but for this year, he's got the opportunity to do that unless some veteran gets in there. And that's kind of where we're on this list and why he's in these, this E tier is a veteran can go just supplant him immediately. Totally. That would not surprise me because I don't think he's that 
good, but if he's better than I think, which happens all the time, and he's in this role, then all of a sudden you are in this kind of touchdown or bust territory. And then also James Cook, very tiny guy, getting a lot of touches. Like who knows how well he'll be able to like hold up uh, long term, anyways. Yeah, I was even just looking some running back free agents out there. Yeah, there's or, other guys that would get get cut. Jordan Mason. Or if Kareem Peters. Hunt goes to this team, you know, then Ray Davis, we can knock him down a few. But we'll see. Yeah. The, I mean, the free, available running backs right now are. Or if they bring back Latavius. Like, yeah, again, 35 year old Latavius. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Oh, goodness. For now, especially when Brandon Bean goes out there and like praises his pass protection, he was asked like the oh, number one play that he remembers. And he's like, it was a pass protection thing. Hello. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of trust mm -hmm. and responsibility. So, yeah, I'm in on Ray Davis, especially compared to others. Okay. Right. This is going to shock people. 30th overall, Giants tight end Theo Johnson. Again, who is a starting tight end for the New York Giants? Is it Daniel Him. Bellinger? You know, Him. or is it the mid round athlete who has already blocked a ton? Who, again, special tight ends are special athletes. He tested as one. This is the formula that it's not always going to pan out, but when right. it does, you have an extreme value on your hands at a position that has a bunch of middling replaceable guys that uh, when a profile hits, uh, he's a differentiator. He's a difference maker at that spot. Yeah. I think this is, this is a, sh a sharp play there. I think that D Daniel Bellinger, they've proven when they brought in Waller, they they're looking for more than Daniel Bellinger at this point. I think that Theo Johnson gives you that up. So there's, there's a lot of freak up freak athletes at tight end. They're like 235 pounds. Like you said at Penn state, like this guy with hand in the dirt, wanting to push you out of the way in the ground game as well. So yeah, dart throws at, at tight ends. They, the, the hits look like this type of profile. Yep. Take your shot. This is way ahead of ADP. I'm sure like Jadavion Sanders is being drafted like a full round yeah. ahead of Theo Johnson, but I am so into athleticism as was the NFL during the NFL draft. Yep. And Theo Johnson should be drafted ahead in my opinion of Jadavion mm -hmm. Sanders. Okay. Speaking of the giants 31st, Running back Tyrone Tracy. Um, yeah. This is simple. We do not run from ambiguous backfields. We run to them, especially with guys with like this statistical and athletic profile. I understand that he was the 32nd pick of the fifth round, but this backfield is Devin Singletary and no one else. I think Tyrone Tracy is a weapon. I understand so many reasons why he fell in the NFL draft. I was certain that a team was going to fall in love with him, but they did not. I think we're going to fall in love with him during preseason, and I could see him carving out a significant, maybe not significant is the right word, but a role in this offense yeah. uh, and see be super explosive. Yeah, I mean, the explosive traits are there. The per-touch numbers were fantastic in terms of breaking tackles, yards after the con contact. He's not 200 pounds. Like, this guy is a little bit thicker than that. No tread on his tires as well. So for somebody that like, switched positions to get drafted at all, I think, is, is something, and we're just drawing parallels between other backfields. We just did with James Conner, Damian Harris. Like, there's like a, I mean, a little bit of James Cook in the Tyrone Tracy profile. Talking about oh, I, this coaching I'm taking staff. it a step up from that. Like, yeah, yeah, no, but just like Brian Dayball has seen this James yeah, Cook yeah. type be a value, and I think that why not Tyrone Tracy? I'm like you said. I mean, the depth chart over there in New York City, it's it's not great. As you said, no tread off his tires, and it was even more. Like versus statistical, when you watch him, like you saw the vision, you saw the cutting. Like yeah. he did not look like he's only played one year at running back. Yeah. It's not easy to be at Purdue. But average if, if that's the game. case, again, I understand why he would last on the board for so long, but I can tell myself a story of a guy who's only been at the position for one year making good on bad draft capital. Right. You know, it's an yeah. unusual prospect. And sometimes that's unusual it. prospects hit. You don't want your day three picks to be six foot, 200 pounds. Like, and they'll look exactly like every other guy. You want them to be a, cut from a different cloth. And maybe that we just overthought the whole damn thing. 32. Another sleeper for the people. Chargers running back. Kamani Vidal out of Troy. So sell me on this one. Please. Once again, do not run from ambiguous backfields. We run to them. He can carry the rock, you know, um, he's done it very well during his career there. And, um, it was just he's, he's got great vision, burst, excellent contact balance, strength. Like he's not a tall back, but he's not a small back. You know, he's 215 pounds, I think, and just runs through arm tackles, can make guys miss. 
take a hit, stay on his feet, great balance, strong, you know, like guys, DBs closing on, punch him, you know, with a stiff arm and just keep going. But just that, you know, competes, you know, and also offers something in the passing game as well. And, he's, and when you watch him block, yeah. it's impressive. Like, he'll, he, he'll throw it up in there against a blitz and linebacker. Badal, fantastic on first contact. He reminded me a bit of, like, Boston Scott when going back and watching him. I know they have Gus Edwards, who is probably going to be the touchdown scorer, but I cannot see Gus Edwards being a goal line to goal line type runner. No. And I understand that they signed J.K. Dobbins. I think if they get anything out of J.K. Dobbins, it's possible. But just recently, we saw a team like the Kansas City Chiefs lean on Isaiah Pacheco in the seventh round as a pick early on because he got his opportunity and he made the most of it. That's all we need in a backfield like the Chargers that is so up for grabs that for some reason didn't invest anything into it. And I just want to take a shot here with my 32nd ranked rookie. Gus Edwards, no money uh, guaranteed beyond this year. And this year's contract is like $3 million. That's nothing. And then J.K. Dobbins signed with the Chargers. It's a $1.6 million deal. And I have not seen any guaranteed money attached to that. And usually that's not a good sign. The agent wants to get the guaranteed money out there. So J.K. Dobbins could easily not make this roster. And he also catches some passes in J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards. That's not necessarily been their M.O. 33, Malachi Corley, Jets wide receiver. Got to say, don't like totally see the vision to trade up from 72 to 65 in the fourth round or the third round for. Yeah. Um, they even said he has things to work on. It's clear where he wins. I mean, he's powerful after catch. He adds a different element versus their wide receiver core that they have. Angry runs. He makes defensive backs pay. But again, you bring this player in because he's a manufactured touch guy that wins after contact. And manufacture touch guys who win after contact have to be scripted plays, have to be design plays. And that typically doesn't lead yeah. itself to consistent, frequent, growing right. roles. And I'm I'm just uncertain if he can grow his game beyond that. And if you look at Dane Brugler's The Beast, he gets the official pro day numbers from them. He's not the freak athlete that people think he is. Like he is, he's a mediocre athlete on top of that. So I saw the same thing. I think he has lots of things to work on as a real wide receiver. And is, is Aaron Rodgers in his first year going to trust some guy de in development to get on the field? I'm not sure. So other than like two or three manufactured touches a game, like I, th I think that's maybe Malachi Corley's aspect to this offense. I mean, unfortunately, like we talked, I think on our show about him, we brought up Amari Rodgers. Yeah. Do you think that Aaron Rodgers loved the Amari Rodgers experience in Green Bay? Next 34. 49ers running back Isaac Corindo from Kyle Shanahan. We wanted to add speed to the running back room. To me, he's basically a uh, Elijah Mitchell second contract replacement. Spot like on. you yeah. pay Christian McCaffrey a bunch of money and then you just churn the backs behind him. And oh, this is a fourth round investment that again, they traded up for. So Corindo, he might not give you anything. He could also, <laughs> as we have seen, shockingly get production and opportunity Right. Uh, I did not love him as a runner in the first half of the season. I thought he grew into it in the second half because he's also, I think, a converted wide receiver. But in the passing game, he's reliable there too. Pass pro and as a receiver, I thought. Yeah, wasn't my favorite tape. Did not think he played as fast. He runs super upright. Um, we'll see. Shanahan's hit rate at running backs, it's it's 50-50. So we'll see. If I had to pick one side, these would probably be the losing side. But at least there's upside. 35. Dolphins, I think, sixth round wide receiver. Malik Washington, uh, let's hear from Mike McDaniel on this one. Loved uh, uh, it. Zeroed in on you. Yeah, he's been, he's been bugging me the grass again the last couple of rounds. Uh, he, that's an understatement. I've, I've been seriously annoy, annoying towards him. Rookie year can be very productive. If you're pro, which I know you can immediately because you're going to have the opportunity. Um, and it can be as much as you want it. You know, Mike McDaniel says and create such interesting things. But then when he gets in the press conferences, Hayden, he never says anything like yeah. they asked him about Malik Washington. He said zero, just like he has to come in here and compete. It's more revealing. I think in that phone conversation, the love he had for him versus right. the 12 minutes he spent in front of media. So also another interesting profile, super late breakout, really tiny player, but very explosive. I believe like 42 in the vert. Uh, and I think there was a little bit of medical with him because he was kind of somebody that was like a third round pick projected. And 
definitely a boom bust third round pick, but him to fall to the sixth round to me is unexplainable unless there was an injury concern with him, which means that this six round draft capital could be like fake six yeah. round draft capital. And let's get real here. Like it's Braxton Berrios and the boys over there as the third wide receiver. It's usually a rotation over there. Uh, Tyree Hill and Jalen Waddle, these guys are in and out of the lineup. And he at least has like the burst to be at worst case. All right, we just need to throw somebody in this position. I think that he kind of fits that mold more than like, your classic Braxton Berrios slot wide receiver. Okay, just to finish this up, 36, Aldrick Estime at the Denver Broncos, the running back. Um, Sean Payton called him a first and second down runner who was great after contact. Uh, again, Sean Payton is not really tied to anyone but Jaleel McLaughlin in this backfield. I know he yeah. brought in um, P. Ryan. Samaje P. Ryan, but like Samaje P. Ryan never he can played. Get cut, and he can get yeah. cut this yeah. year before the uh, season starts. Maybe Samaje P. Ryan has gone to the Buffalo Bills, but they don't have any money either. Let's let's not forget they have no I mean, money. Samaj appearance is probably not going to be that expensive. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I think that Estime is a decent player, but yeah. going to the Broncos, like it's just for the Broncos offense to get serious. A lot of things have to click. Right. So there, this is like a, a three leg parlay that we have to hit with Estime. 37. I actually have Jalen McMillan, the other wide receiver from Washington. He was a third round pick, I believe by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, yeah, maybe fourth. It's a lot. I even thought Trey Palmer was fine this past season. Uh, I'm optimistic. He was a third. Yeah. Yeah. Third. You know, Jim McMillan was one of these players that like had his fan base during draft season. So I went in and watched him. I thought he was interesting. I also think there's a Jim McMillan in every single draft class. And that's why he's yeah. this far down the list. Yeah. We'll see what the, how the new offense wants to utilize these guys. I think he's probably gonna be the number four. Cause I think that Trey Palmer is a little bit more yeah. exciting to me than Jalen McMillan, but yeah, we're, we're at that tier, like you said. You warned us. Okay, 38, Luke McCaffrey. I have nothing to say about Luke McCaffrey. Uh, then Will Shipley here at 39 to the Philadelphia Eagles. Their running back, they called him, has the ability to make guys miss, throw out of the backfield, can line up all over the field. He had a 4.0 GPA because he wants to beat people's ass in academics as well. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then we'll... Yeah, 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 they said that. <laughs> um, and then I'm closing out with uh, Bucky Irving, running back who's going to displace Chase Edmonds with the... Tempe Buccaneers right. and then uh, 41 Jatavian Sanders uh, again understand that Jatavian Sanders was the first pick of the fourth round and went ahead of another tight end I talked about but I think he's a super limited athlete who's supposed to win at athletic things at the tight end position I shouldn't say super yeah. limited I should just say average athlete who's supposed to win yeah. at extreme athletic spots at the tight end position I think he's more, if he gets lucky, he's Dalton Schultze. Like, I don't think that he's going to be anything beyond that athletically. I will say Luke McCaffrey. Brevin Jordan. I think Brevin Jordan is a perfect comparison for him. Yeah. He's very productive. We thought he was going to be a better athlete. It really wasn't. Um, Luke McCaffrey, I think, is going to start immediately. Whoa. Who else is who else, in the slot? I mean, who else Who else <laughs> do they have? Like, it sounds crazy, but he put up crazy numbers. Talking about I just didn't really up. like him. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the commanders did go in third round with them. There's There I really is part, just not you, another. You know, this might be dumb. I think part of it is Adam Peters just spent so much time with Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah. That he's um, like, we'll I need see. to get me one of these. Yeah. And then I thought Will Shipley, um, if something happens to Saquon Barkley, I think I think Will Shipley would get a lot of touches. Wow. He's, so, he's better than Kenny Gainwell. So you want to move Will Shipley higher up this list, I'm sure. Like, yeah, you want to put him ahead of like Malachi Corley. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Yeah, I, I just when when you brought up Jalen McMillan, I was like, oh, this list is over. And then just, you threw in those two guys. I think that I'd rather take upside swings with. I like this through forty one actually than I did last year through forty one. Um, yeah, I was looking back at some like fourth round rookie draft picks last year in Dynasty, and it was brutal. It right. wasn't and, really brutal. And if you look at uh, there's some big boards out there for the twenty twenty five like no quarterbacks in the first round or one or two. And they're ranked in the twenties. I w there's a couple wide receivers, but there's not like some stud running backs either. So like if you can flip future picks for, for this year's picks, um, I don't, I don't hate that either. Real quick. We liked Johnny Wilson a lot heading into the draft. Johnny Wilson ended up being a six round selection. Mm -hmm. Howie Roseman saw what we did. He was questioned if he should move to tight end, which by the way, the Eagles have like taken big wide receivers and kind of shifted them to tight end um, or just big bodies and try them out tight end. How he said, no, he run, he ran the full route tree. All of his production came outside. He is unusual. Speaking to that unusualness, uh, I go and watch all these interviews too. 
Okay. Johnny Wilson did not do an interview after being picked, yeah. um, which is on my radar. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I like the unusual things. Something we keep talking about. If you're going on day three, I want you to be a weird, weird profile. And at least Johnny Wilson has that. And it's Javante Parker that he's competing with out there. We'll see if he can get onto the field. It's not looking yeah. good, though. <laughs> as, as Howie said, some of the great sixth and seventh round picks we've ever made were Jason Kelsey, freak. Jordan Mailata, freak. So if you're going to hit on guys on day three, they better be unusual. This is the easiest way to use athletic testing. The yeah. easiest way to use athletic testing. Yeah. Yep. Take a shot rather than like, hey, let's take the bad athlete who looks good on special teams. Yeah, who cares? Who, who cares? cares? <laughs> I mean, truly, who cares? <laughs> um, okay. Nice and done, it. Josh. I, I did my best. I know I spoke a lot in that one, but uh, no, that was good. This is my homework to, to put together the top yeah. 41. And as you all know, let me know in the comments what you would have changed, mm -hmm. which players you ended up with in your draft. I'd love to hear that too. Yeah, I think it's very valuable. You go through, listen to all these press conferences, all these little details, I think really do matter. So very good episode. All right, there it is. Uh, we'll be back later on this week with actual rankings for other positions as well. So be on the lookout, hit subscribe, thumbs up. Shout out to Producer Weaves. Shout out to Hayden. Talk to y'all soon. See ya.